Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Hello, my name is Dacian White. I am a graduating senior, a proud member of the class of 2022. I want to start off with a warm welcome to each and every single one of you. I might argue that it was destiny to, for me to be giving this speech right here at this moment. I want to tell a quick story as to why I believe this to be true. At 16 years old, I was a junior in high school and I wanted to get a tattoo. Reluctantly, my mother agreed only, and I mean only, if it had a significant meaning. And I speak for myself and some others, whatever my mother says goes. I thought about this for weeks and weeks on end. I pondered about what I wanted to get that would leave a mark on me for a lifetime. Something with meaning, something of value, something with a message. I knew I wanted a quote, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted it to say. I, first, I searched for some key and powerful words, and I came across a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The quote, the quote goes like this, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Those exact words are tattooed on the left side of my chest. At 16, I had out of high school and succumbing to a drug-filled environment. You today, I'm reminded of all the challenges and controversies I have had to face to be on this stage. A graduate generation needs us. We are facing voter suppression, police killings, and we have to remember those who died in the streets. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, and countless others. Dr. Anderson's lecture today will present to us on what World's House means. And as I understand World House, we are all one, fighting for the other, standing up for the other. Here at Denison, this is our house, and we are part of the world's house. We cannot forget those who are oppressed and marginalized. We have too much power, too much greatness, and too much responsibility for one another. I ask again, where do we stand? Is it here at the university house on the hill, or are we part of the world house? I pose this question to you again, where do you stand? Later this evening, we will continue to celebrate MLK's legacy with food, student performances, service, and a screening of the movie Selma. With this being said, it is my pleasure to introduce to you President Weinberg. Give Dacian another round of applause. Thank you for being a Denisonian. Uh, first and foremost, um, I just want to acknowledge how nice it is to be standing up here today in Swayze Chapel with our community. Um, we've not done this in almost two years, and I can say it is something I've missed. I also want to thank Dr. Victor Anderson for being here with us today. Um, we are honored. We are grateful for your presence. Um, for our students who have not maybe had the treat of hearing a true public lecture, um, you're in for a treat today. I want to thank everybody at Denison who helped make this happen, our students, our faculty, and our staff who put a lot of time into organizing today. And in particular, I want to thank Professor Terrence Dean and the Black Studies Department. Um, for making today happen and for everything you do for the college every day. So MLK Day um, is always an important day at Denison. It's the only day, it's the only time each year that we take a day away from classes as a community to reflect, to learn, and to celebrate together. In my view, Martin Luther King Jr. remains one of the great moral and political philosophers in history. Dr. King articulated and fought for a vision of a more diverse America where all people enjoyed the benefits of equality. He was committed to civil rights, humanitarian values, and a more just and equitable world. We need more ways to grapple with, to understand, 
and quite frankly, to make progress on the issues Dr. King articulated, fought for, and led us on. We have inherited legacies of slavery and racism, and we need to be the ones to deal with that legacy to create a more equitable and inclusive future. In an often repeated quote, Dr. King once said, let us realize the arc of a moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. In my years as a college professor, president of an NGO working on social justice issues and now a college president, I've learned that this work is hard and it is complicated, but it is also some of the most important work that we can do together. We have tremendous opportunities on this campus to make Denison a college that others talk about because we have become a campus that embraces diversity, equity, belonging, inclusion, and anti-racism as defining values and core strengths. Academic institutions need to be places that are characterized by differences. First and foremost, it's an ethical issue. Every institution of higher education should be committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging as part of its mission. It's also a practical issue. Difference helps generate new knowledge and improves the quality of our thought, our ability to be creative, and our capacity to solve problems. It makes our communities healthier, more interesting, and just. Since we last convened together for MLK Day in January of 2020, anti-racism has become part of our campus vocabulary and focus. As a sociologist, I welcome this addition. It's the work of those with historic power and privilege that need to step into this space and work to dismantle structures of racism on our campus and beyond. It's a call for all of us to do our part. I'm inspired by all the students, faculty, and staff in this campus who are doing that work. When I arrived at Denison nine years ago, I was struck by how committed the campus community was to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Having come from a place that was working on social justice issues in over 70 countries, I felt fortunate to arrive at a college that was committed to significant resources being put behind these efforts. I was also impressed and inspired by the willingness of this campus community to talk openly and honestly about where we fall short and what we're gonna do about it. I feel fortunate and honored to be part of an academic community where people care and are always striving to make our community more open, more just, and forward-looking. Dr. King commented about education. The function of an education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character that is the goal of a true education. Our mission is to create autonomous thinkers, discerning moral agents, and engaged citizens. We aspire to educate and graduate students who will be involved in democratic ways of life and who will be citizens who act based upon independent thinking in a strong moral core. We immerse students in a challenging, engaging, broad-based education that develops a set of attributes that we hope allows our graduates to think critically, understand profoundly, and connect broadly. We also aspire to create within our graduates a way of being in the world. The liberal arts, liberal arts students experience the beauty and meaning of intellectual pursuits, rigorous scholarship, sharp thinking, the thrill of knowledge for its own sake, and the impact of learning when standards are high, classmates are engaged with the course material and with each other. This type of learning extends across campus. Dr. King once said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they've not communicated with each other. We require all of our students to live on campus. We are a fully residential college. We do that because we believe there's something powerful and important about living with a diversity of high achieving peers who are committed to the liberal arts, who want to do well in life, and who also want to contribute to things that are larger than themselves. We believe our students challenge 
and learn from each other. We believe the more diverse we are, the more that takes place. We are a college community that sees diversity as a source of strength. We are a college that aspires to be a community where every member feels valued, listened to, and respected. We aspire to be a community where people proactively seek out those whose life experiences are different from their own because they've come to see diversity as interesting and fun and they seek to build organizations and friendship groups that represent the diversity of our college. Today is about celebrating Dr. King. It's about reminding ourselves about Dr. King's legacy. We always do this by inviting a speaker who's carrying on the legacy of Dr. King and who can help educate and inform us about the work that's being done, the progress that is happening, and the work left in front of us. Dr. Anderson, thank you for being here today. It is now my honor to introduce our university chaplain, Reverend Stephanie McLemore, to the stage. It seems fitting today to offer an invocation in the words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Will you join me in the spirit of prayer and reflection? Disturb us, O oh Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dreamed too little, because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, O oh Lord, with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the water of life, when having fallen in love with time, we have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision to grow dim. Stir us, O Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture into wider seas, where storms show thy mastery, when losing sight of land we shall find the stars. In the name of him who pushed back the horizons of our hopes and invited the brave to follow. Amen. I now welcome Planning Committee member Micah Arnold to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Micah Arnold. I'm currently a senior studying political science, philosophy, and economics. Uh, and I have been bestowed the great honor of introducing our keynote speaker, um, Reverend Dr. Victor Anderson. Victor Anderson is the Oberlin Theological School Professor of Ethics and Society at the Divinity School. He is also the professor in the program in African American and Diaspora Studies and Religious Studies in the College of Arts and Sciences. He holds degrees from Calvin Theological Seminary, including the Master of Divinity and Master of Theology in, philosoph in Philosophical and Moral Theology. He earned a Master's and PhD in religion, and Prince in religion from Princeton University in Religion, Ethics, and Politics. Anderson has published three books, Beyond Ontological Blackness, an essay in African-American religious and cultural criticism, excuse me, um, uh, beyond, I'm sorry, pragmatic theology, negotiating the intersection of an American philosophy and religion and public theology, and creative exchange, a constructive theology of African American religious experiences. He also teaches courses in philosophy of religion, philosophical, and theological and social ethics, African American religious studies, and American philosophy and religious thought. Without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome Do Reverend Dr. Victor Anderson. mask it tied up to my hearing aids. <laughs> there. While I'm doing this, I'll just say, God bless you. 
I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to be here. I thank all who, those, President Weinberg, Raj, and all those on the committee who uh, brought me here to Denison. You're welcome. Your introduction made me proud. I'm proud to stand in this podium with you. I'm an old Baptist boy, so if you need to stand up to stretch your legs, go ahead and feel free to do just that. I don't want you to get scared by the number of pages I'm turning. I just want you to know they're in 14 fonts. Okay. I want to talk this afternoon on the topic living between a long arc of justice and beloved community in our times of crises and our times of hope. Sitting on the basement floor looking into my grandmother's face, I was an eight-year-old boy watching and listening to Dr. King's speech on the Washington Mall. Tears were rolling down her face, and yet her face was filled with pride. No idea had I of why she should be so tearful. I only saw on that little black and white television a bunch of black men standing around a little black preacher who was preaching to masses of people and reiterating, I have a dream today. I too at eight years old was swept up by the enthusiasm of the masses and the rhythms of his oration. Immediately after the speech, I went out to the backyard to play. There in the backyard was a great giant tree stump. Mounting that stump by the play of my imagination, it was immediately transformed into a podium. From that tree stump, I belted out as loudly to all who could hear, I have a dream today. A million blades of grass turned into a multitude of grass people there to see and hear me. From that stump, I intonated that black preacher saying, I have a dream today. And the multitude of grass people rose, shouting back to me jubilantly in call and response. Yes, yes, yes. Tiny brown and black ants stood up in unending applauses. Birds of all sorts, swallows, robin, cardinals, even pigeons, flip-flopped all over heaven, clanging their wings symphonically. Their chirping sang out loudly, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. So, overcome by the excitement of play, unbeknown to me, my Aunt Beanie, then in her 80s, was watching from the bathroom window. She saw and heard me, and then she prophesied to Mama, my grandmother, that God had given her a preacher in the family. Since that day, I have been living between the bathroom window and a multitude of grass people. That moment is rooted deeply in my lifelong study of moral speech, language, and rhetoric. So much so that I made the study of these things my vocation. This afternoon, I smile with affection as I recall what I heard and experienced on King's moral record, of King's moral rhetoric, and what it contributed to the legacy of American public theology. I have described elsewhere American public theology as involving religious thinkers and leaders constructing and transmitting religious and moral languages that sustains the political community and practices oriented toward 
our political and moral strivings as a nation. But public theology also articulates religious and moral languages that correct the ethical conscience of the nation, especially when public life is governed by policies that violate the democratic fulfillment of citizens. Public theology intervenes with the depth dealing effects of US power overwhelms poor people around the world. Dr. King stood among giants of American public theology in the first half of the 20th century. Many people recognized early in his ministry an emerging national Jeremiah. But not everyone shared this prophetic image of King. This was especially true of a young generation of black university students, radicalized by emerging texts coming from a post-colonial Africa, negritude. They were exposed to black consciousness, and they were exposed by English translations of Franz Fanon's revolutionary call for a black militarism. This company of young black critics found King's strategy of nonviolent direct action too weak. Although this counter discourse would follow King throughout the 1960s and the voices of the black power advocates and the Black Panther Party, just to name a few. But as early as June 4th, 1957, King was found speaking to a group of young people at the University of California at Berkeley. He was explaining his philosophy of nonviolent direct action. He was keenly aware that to this crowd, nonviolent resistance or direct action was not likely to win him any favors among young black radicals. They were skeptical of King's philosophy. They were skeptical of his faith in God. They were cynical about his conviction that God was on the side of love and justice and the present struggles for civil equalities in America. No, as he tried to explain the ways that love was compatible with robust social activism and that nonviolent direct action was compatible with the demands of social justice, King could not assume a rhetorical advantage for his Christian faith and his high religion among these students. He was face to face with students who could not and would not accept what he and other Christians took for granted, namely that love and justice characterize God's essence, that love and justice are divine commands, that love and justice are the essential content of a Christian's witness to the public and its problems. Then King offered these skeptical listeners a powerful image of all pervasive justice. This is what he said to those students. I am aware of the fact that there are persons who believe firmly in nonviolence, who do not believe in a personal God, but I think every person who believes in nonviolent resistance, believes somehow that the universe in some form is on the side of justice, that there is something unfolding in the universe, whether one speaks of it as an unconscious process or whether one speaks of it as some, a mood mover or whether someone speaks of it as a personal God, there is something in the universe that unfolds for justice. And so in Montgomery, 
We felt somehow that as we struggled, we had cosmic companionship. And this was one of the things that kept the people together. They believed that the universe is on the side of justice. King evoked an all pervasive confidence that no matter what creed or faith, no matter whether one even confessed or rejected such things, no matter the social positions one may embrace, he was confident that in this world, by a long arc bending toward justice, and the end of that arc, whose long arc bends toward justice. But this moral rhetoric points backwards. It takes us to an earlier American public theologian, the preacher and theologian, Dr. Theodore Parker of Harvard University. On January 29th, 1858, Reverend Parker stood in the Massachusetts State House Hall to speak on the present aspect of slavery in America and the immediate duty of the North. He was speaking at the Anti-Slavery Convention and he said these words, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is so long. My eyes reach but just a little. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of my sight. I can't divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward alone assured his confidence of an all-pervasive justice and the same force of conscience also propelled King among American public theologians. These were American public theologians who articulated their faith in Christian social witness from the vanity I have more to say about this a bit later. In a preliminary way, talk of a high religion articulates universal principles, languages, symbols, values, and doctrines of a social or common faith. As the American pragmatic philosopher John Dewey would write in a book by the same title, A Common Faith. This common faith promised the amelioration, the bettering of apparently interminable and unending conflicts between competing local faiths and moralities. With the high religion, the local yields to a common social faith. It is a social faith in human creative intelligence for human betterment. Do we envision a social faith where human creative intelligence will progressively organize and direct the advancement of our common democratic life, practices, longings, and hopes? Democracy and creative human intelligence will serve as religious and moral regulators without the benefit of religion, which he took to be an impediment to social improvement. Democracy and creative human intelligence would displace the authority of religion over the social, political, and moral endeavors of citizens. And democracy and human creative intelligence would guide us to a world house. Together, democracy and creative human intelligence would be guardians over public reasonableness and referee 
over universal truth. Democracy and creative human intelligence would join forces with the spirit of progressive liberal theology to produce an arsenal of religious and moral symbols from Immanuel Kant's kingdom of ends, Albert Ritual's kingdom of God, Walter Rauschenbusch's social gospel, Josiah Royce's great community and great hope, to Howard Thurman's creative encounter, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s moral arc, world house, and beloved community. In the first half of the 20th century, these symbols of American public theology were called upon by public theologians to protect our fragile democratic life against false contenders, false contenders to the absolute, and safeguard the common good against the dogmatism of local faith and private interests masking as universal truths. The American father of the social gospel, Walter Rauschenbusch, and a theology of social gospel articulated this high religion in the language of a social Christianity that would usher in the kingdom of God on earth. Immoral man and immoral society, Union Theological Seminary theologian Reinhold Niebuhr placed his ultimate confidence in what he called the impossible possibility of neighborly love. Confident that neighborly love morally affects individual lives even when our social institutions are driven by self-interest and sustained by pervasive malice. His brother at Yale Divinity School, H. Richard Niebuhr, affirmed his confidence in a radical monotheism in a book by the same title. His radical monotheism was a sacred canopy on which every national and cultural deity, whether race, class, denomination, party loyalty, or capitalism, socialism, or communism, all of which H. Richard called national henotheism, they are all relative and pale in power to the one above the many. And the preeminent German immigrant theologian, Paul Tillich, in the Protestant era, evoked what he called the Protestant principle. Here he insisted that the radical transcendence of God relativizes all pretenders to the absolute. And then there was King. Among this company of public theologians, a preacher theologian advocating love and justice as God's overarching powers in the social world. He was then, and perhaps even today, the most significant Jeremiah of American Christian social ethics and public theology. As a public theologian, he was constructing and transmitting religious and moral languages that sustains the political community and practices oriented toward moral fulfillment of all, while correcting the ethical conscience of the nation, whose policy death dealing effects over the poor throughout the globe. What united these American public theologians was a common faith, a high religion, without which our common life is faded to the parochialisms and dogmatisms of private interests, local faiths, social conflicts, and crises. But that was King's moment in time. For the political, progressive, liberal consensus that held these public theologians together has now collapsed. 
Their utopian optimism and human goodwill, their ethical triumphalism of social Christianity, the social gospel, the kingdom of God on earth, and King's world, house, and beloved community, combined with the spirit of denominational ecumenism, all this, too, have passed away. Many lament the loss of this liberal progressive Christian consensus, and with it, the loss of a common social faith. One American theologian at Stanford University, Van Harvey, in a 1989 essay, lamented the passing away of American public theology when surveying contemporary theologies. He found contemporary theology intellectually unchallenging, at times divisive and parochial, and he especially found them publicly irrelevant. I can safely say, said Harvey, that Ryan Ho Niebuhr and Paul Tillich were the last two public theologians in the country, that is, theologians whose names were recognized because they contributed to those types of discourse that seriously engaged American intellectuals, uh, quote. He judged our contemporary public life intellectually impoverished by their loss. Harvey complained, I quote him, not only have we lost the language of moral, of moral religion, and a common discourse, but we have lost the sense of what Niebuhr called a high religion and what it might contribute to public life. One does not need to be a Christian to regret this loss, he says. Sorrowfully, he cried, oh, Reinhold Niebuhr, where are you when we need you most? To you listening to me this afternoon, although a contemporary of Niebuhr and Tillich, whom Harvey credits as the last of the era of American public theologians, Harvey's lament takes no consciousness of King's social role as a public theologian. And this omission deserves lamenting. Nevertheless, Harvey's demand for a high religion, so lamented by him, as hard to sell in our postmodern moment. This is a moment characterized by fragmented knowledges, balkanized politics, globally destructive market forces of neo capitalism, and the ontological priority of difference over the universal human. Ours is a moment where we are forced to ask, what does it mean to live meaningfully as people committed to democratic convictions and practices absent the social benefit of a high religion? How are we to live between King's long moral arc of the universe, bending toward justice and his hopes of a world house and beloved community. Can we count on a high religion and morality to provide us today with enough hope and human goodwill for our times of social, political, and global crises? Such questions are what Professor Cornel West calls deep Socratic questionings. In his book, Democracy Matters, Winning the Fight Against Imperialism, West says, deep Socratic questioning emerges from our political culture, which is defined by perpetual violence and balkanized politics. They emerge from public and moral panic over white people's fears of losing their country and black people's aspiration for gaining our country. 
They emerge in social contexts of unrelentless killings of young black children, men, women, and transgender people whose color of skin, texture of hair, sexual gender identities, frightening big bodies, and more make them targets of over-policing, over-incarceration, and political disenfranchisement. Deep Socratic questioning and company killings in mosques, synagogues, and churches as the faithful gather for worship. How shall we talk of a high religion, a common social faith, when citizens are killed in mass while going to movie theaters, schools, nightclubs, shopping centers, and music festivals? Will hope of a moral universe, who long arch bend toward justice, comfort families and communities, anguished and weeping for their children, for their posterity is reduced to bare flesh. I am reminded of the fears that accompany my growing up in the age of the Vietnam War, articulated in a haunting folk song of a generation of youthful, wandering flower children in the 1960s in San Francisco. They were singing, where have all the flowers gone? Gone to the graveyards, everyone. When will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? Now on this same folk song accompanies the lament of our postmodern moment. When so much in need of justice, so much in need of hope, so much in need of beloved community. This afternoon, I'm driven to deep Socratic questioning, asking a question that the American public theologians I have talked about above will find morally absurd. Is there enough goodwill among ourselves to make their dreams and visions of a high religion, of a common social faith, a reality? Such Socratic questions lead me in search for American public theology for our times of crises and hope in the absence of the high religion once enjoyed by Dr. King. This is a great challenge. Dr. West, my beloved teacher, is also troubled and writes. A decade ago, I wrote Race Matters in order to spark a candid public conversation about America's most explosive issue and most difficult dilemma. The ways in which the vicious legacy of white supremacy contributes to the arrested development of American democracy. This book, The Sequence to Race Matters, looks unflinchingly at the waning of democratic energies and practices in our present age of the American empire. There is a deeply troubling deterioration of democratic powers in America today. Professor West. As with Harvey Sowett West, who laments the loss of prophetic progressive social Christianities and public theologies that made for a creative interchange between democracy and progressive Christian social witness, and which offer powerful critiques of and challenges to our public lives and social problems. Progressive liberal democratic faith and the common good and democratic practices appear on West's account to have succumbed to what he calls the three dogmas of American empire. They are free market fundamentalism, aggressive militarism, and escalating authoritarianism. With free market fundamentalism, West says, is the unregulated and unfettered market, as idle and fetish, 
where corporate leaders are worshiped and endowed with powers of monetary salvation for the most wealthy at the cost of genuine public needs. Aggressive militarism. Positive military might ask Vivek, in a world in which he who has the most and biggest weapons is the most moral and masculine, hence worthy of policing others. Escalating authoritarianism. Russia's end to protect us from the paranoia of potential terrorists, fears of too many liberties, and our deep distrust of one another. West fears that these three dogmas of American empire are, and this is him, snuffing out the democratic impulses that are so vital for deepening the spread of democracy in the world, unquote. The late Harvard theologian, Ron Thiemann understood the demise of the American public theology to be the consequence of the destructive forces of our postmodern condition. And it's destabilizing and trivializing universal reason, putting to an end the guardianship of public theology over public reasonableness and agreements by anesthetizing its capacity for refereeing social conflicts. The human is thereby brought into deep Socratic questioning when he writes, will religious convictions and theological analysis have real impact on the way our public lives are structured? Can a truly public theology be salutary, be a salutary influence? on the development of public policy within a pluralistic democratic nation. The real challenge to a North American public theology is to find a way within the social, cultural, and religious pluralism of American politics to influence the development of public policy while seeking to construct, ready, a new Christendom or relapsing into benign relativism. The even wonders whether we can articulate faith's witness to the public and its problems without falling prey to a new Christendom or the banality of relativism as the only available contenders for grounding contemporary faith and hope of goodwill absent a high religion. Really? A new Christendom? The banality of relativism? Is this what we are left with? Neither are lively options for contemporary effective social ethics and the social problems we face. With a new Christendom, the church, or as a post-liberal theologian such as Daniel Harwars might have it, the Christian community keeps in check the authority of the secular by out narrating all secular contenders, including democracy and King's high religion that once provided transcendent meaning to the secular. Narratives of a secular progressive liberal vision of democracy are out narrated by a larger and more enduring narrative of Christian identity and formation. And from these, they determine the responsibilities Christians owe to the public and its problem. On the other hand, taking ethical resolve and a benign relativism of distinct publics, local knowledge, and, moral, uh, and morals operate as absolute over a generalizable public, and our public lives are left to the contingency of small city-states each vying for the loyalty of their members for defense and survival against contending and threatening publics. We return to something like Thomas Hobbes' state of nature doctrine, which is a state of perpetual warring interests. A new Christendom and the banality of relativism threatens and revolts Robust vision 
of democratic practices so much in need of 21st century public theology to disdain, sustain our democratic and moral longings. Derek Bell, one of the founders of critical race theory. After 20 years looking back on civil rights activism and the gains of the 1960s, feared in his book, and we are not yet saved, the elusive quest for racial justice, that we are not yet saved. We are not yet saved, but live in the absence of a high religion between King's long moral arc, bending toward justice, and as host of a world house and beloved community. I cite Bell at length, who frames King's public theology under the image of an American Jeremiah. This is Derrick Bell. Jeremiah's lament that we are not yet saved echoes down through the ages and give appropriate voice to press the concerns of those who flushed with the enthusiasm generated by the Supreme Court's 1952 holding that segregated public schools are unconstitutional, pledged publicly that the progeny, progeny of America's slave would be at last free by 1963, the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. That pledge became the model for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's 1969 convention in New York City, where we gathered in jubilant euphoria, veterans of racial bias and society's hostility, who believed that they had finally and permanently achieved the reform of the laws that had been for centuries vehicles for the oppression of the black men women, and children. Not even the most skeptical at the convention could be so eroded as to bring us at once again into faithful and frightful coincidence with Jeremiah's lament. With the realization that salvation of racial equality has eluded us again, questions arise from the ashes of our expectations. Unquote. Bell's lament reaches to our present moment that's come to witness what Bell foretold of the permanence of racism, not only as America's original sin, but in the words of one 17th century political theorist, Baruch Spinoza, it is the principle of our own ill constitution. American theologian Van Harvey once cried out in anguish, oh, Reinhold Niebuhr, where are you when we need you most? So many today are lamenting, oh, Martin, where are you when we need you most? But I am sadly reminded of an episode of Aaron Magruder's satirical cartoon series, Boondocks. The episode is titled, The Return of the King. Here we freed men and a young black radical dreams that Dr. King had not really died by assassin's bullet, but he survived in a coma for 32 years. Suddenly he awakes, fully woke, in the 21st century, walking the streets named after him. He enters a polling station, but is turned away because of voting irregularities. Dismayed, he walks the streets, observing gang violence, mass incarceration, police brutality, and so much more. We are asked to imagine against all of this King's dream of a colorblind society. Driven to despair, 
Dr. King gives a speech that concludes, I have seen the promised land, and y'all ain't got nothing to look forward to. The episode ends with Huey Freeman saying, it's fun to dream. But this afternoon, my friends, as St. Paul admonishes, we will not grieve as those who have no hope. Rather, urgings for reclaiming King's high religion for our contemporary moment are not to be driven by nostalgia for bygone public theology. Our need for a vital prophetic witness to the public's problems is too great to spend on laments. Rather, I want to propose that if the postmodern challenges we face to a contemporary American public theology points away from the universal to the local, then perhaps, just perhaps, there to the local we must turn. And there, if we look long enough, if we look hard enough for traces, perhaps, just perhaps, something of a high religion might be found. But let me be very clear. There is nothing safe about the local. For just as many people of goodwill are there, there are also others organizing the local as the background for the dissemination of hatred, malice, privilege, resentment, and power to define our country. But to those of goodwill, perhaps in local communities of organized around the care and commitment to the poor, perhaps, just perhaps, something of Rockshin Bush's social gospel might be embodied in the everyday activities of community organizers, feeding the hungry, clothing the destitute, sheltering the homeless, educating the uneducated, and empowering the powerless. Perhaps, just perhaps, have we looked long enough and hard enough into the local activities of faithful ordinaries, as political theorist Raman Coles calls them. Something of Ryan Ho neighbor's social faith in nebula love as a realization of an impossible possibility might be located, alive and at work among the community organizing of faithful ordinaries. Faithful ordinaries may be bound by a single mission of care for those who fall out Inside the nation's care, sometimes risking their own lives to support and defend refugees of mass poverty seeking asylum in the United States. Perhaps, just perhaps. Weak may be the past ethical triumphalism of the kingdom of God on earth, of social Christianity, of a moral universe whose long arch been towards justice of our whole world house and of beloved community dreamed of and preached about by Dr. King and for which he died. But perhaps, just perhaps, if we look long enough and hard enough, something of the reality of these symbols might be found among local faithful, ordinaries. How then shall we live between a moral universe whose long arc bends toward justice and hope for a world house and beloved community in the absence of a high religion? We turn to local, faithful, ordinaries. To radically participating democratic citizens who mind from our social conflict and crisis and our faiths and hopes, renewable resources of religious and moral languages that offer meaning and value 
to our democratic longing and practices while correcting the ethical conscience of the nation when public life is governed by policies that violate the democratic fulfillment of citizens and issues in the death dealing effects of US power over poor throughout the world. The great historian and statesman of the great civil rights movement the late great Dr. Vincent Hardy, articulates such an ongoing work of American public theology. This is what he says. Advancing democracy, healing the nation, developing humane institutions, whatever we call it, is a grand and costly vocation. Some have paid the cost with their lives on behalf of all of us. But the cost continues. For what is also obvious by now is that the fulfillment of democracy is a continuing task, one that each generation must actively take up, coming to grips with the harsh enemies of apathy and ignorance, cynicism, and immobilizing fear. The local, it's the site of creative conflict and creative exchanges. We in faithful ordinaries affirm and hold and check totalized interests of distinct publics, but always wait a view to wider interests of the generalized republic. In the visions and dreams of faithful ordinaries, perhaps, just perhaps, have we looked long enough and hard enough, we might find traces of the great hope of democratic fulfillment, of that impossible possibility of increasing love between individuals and community. And yes, my friends, perhaps, just perhaps, we might find among faithful ordinaries evidence of King's moral arc bending toward justice, and even a smidgen of the world house and beloved community embodied among religious and moral imaginaries of our own times of crises and hope. Thank you for listening to me and some of my deep Socratic questioning this afternoon. Thank you. Dr. Anderson, what do you think will be the things to take up for the generation here represented by our college students? One of the great advantages you have and we have for those of us who are gathered in such communities with such privilege, we have the privilege of questioning, to engage in deep questioning throughout a multiplicity of fields, sciences, of which the knowledge that is derived from affects the world throughout, the people, the poor throughout the world. If we take advantage of this opportunity to engage in such a deep Socratic questioning, wherever they lead you, then the task of education for democratic life has been fulfilled. That is the task of every generation, and we can no longer leave that to a prior generation as its only task. It is now handed down to us. It is in our hands the power to affect social change through deep Socratic questioning. 
And guess what else? Imagination. All right, you may have been expecting me to go sit behind the keyboard and to play another selection. Well, you have been sitting too long, so now I'm going to let you do the work. Do me a favor, please. I want to hear everybody just knock on the pew. Just let me hear it. Oh, that's good. Now, let me hear everybody clap. That'll work. Do you realize that the civil rights movement was not quiet? You've been sitting here for nearly an hour, over an hour. Quiet. It's time to make some noise. Everybody that wants to, I want you to beat on the pew, but I want you to do it in rhythm. Here we go. So it's going to be. There you go. Keep it steady. Keep it steady. Now, those of you that don't want to beat on the pew, I want you to clap here. There you go. Keep it going. Keep it steady. Keep it steady. Ain't going to let nobody turn me around. Turn me around. Turn me around. Ain't going to let nobody Turn me around, I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, walking up to freedom land. You all aren't allowed to sing because of COVID, so you just keep the beat for me, okay? Ain't gonna let politicians turn me around. Turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let politicians turn me around. Gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. One more. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Gonna keep on marching, keep on talking, walking up to freedom land. Thank you. God bless y'all.